In this video, we're going to take a look at the normal distribution. Uh, as we look at a variety of distributions, each distribution is typically used for modeling in certain specific circumstances. Now, many phenomena in the real world are, are modeled using a normal distribution. So specifically when we have a random variable, um, and in the case of the normal distribution, that random variable, if, if it tends to be the case that most of the values that occur in that distribution are near the mean and fewer are farther away, then you get what's called a, a normal distribution or sometimes called a Gaussian distribution for, for uh, Frederick Gauss, the mathematician and statistician. For example, the distribution of people's heights tends to be bell-shaped. So you might have heard that phrase. You might have heard a bell curve before. Such a bell-shaped distribution is called a normal distribution. This is the way many normal phenomena are, are distributed. So you'll often see something that, that maybe looks like, looks like this. It looks like a, a very nice symmetric, as symmetric as I can draw it, I suppose a very symmetric distribution and the ends taper off towards towards zero. Now the, the domain of this function, despite its real world implications, is negative infinity to positive infinity. So here is x, here is the density, and in the same regard as as other distributions, we know that for a probability density function, the area under, under this normal curve is going to be one, but keep in mind that this goes on infinitely in both directions. It just gets very, very, very close to zero. So in situations like people's heights, you know, we may have, for instance, the average height mu, maybe as, maybe as, uh, we'll say, 65 inches. And, and then most people are, are not too much shorter or too much taller than that. So that very few people who are, say, 75 inches. And you'll have very few people who are, who are, um, say, 30 inches. Maybe, maybe we're talking more children in that case. Um, and as we, get situations like this where we, where we're going, going to see the bulk of, of values really centered around, around our, our mean value. Now, this is a symmetric distribution. Mu basically splits this in half. So for a normal distribution, the mean is equal, is equal to the median because it is symmetric and all the values that are extreme over here are counteracted by all these that are extreme. So when you average them out, you get exactly the, 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 the mean, which is also going to be the, the median. It's going to split the lower 50% from the upper 50%. So we have 50% of our distribution here and 50% here. Now, interestingly, there is a connection between the binomial distribution and the normal distribution. A normal distribution can be thought of as the shape of a binomial distribution when the number of values possible becomes infinitely large. In other words, as a binomial random variable becomes less discrete, its continuous represent representation is that of a normal distribution. So we can actually take a look at an, an applet, and we have this applet down here, the simulation applet, so I'm going to go ahead and, and, and show this, that if we pull up a, actually this is for the probability calculator, but if we come over to the probability calculator, and, and we see here that by default it's the normal distribution, because it's the, one of the most common ones, but let's change the distribution to a binomial. And what we're going to do is we'll, we'll, there might be a way to superimpose a curve, but even with n equals 20, uh, we see that this is, this is somewhat bell shaped, but watch what happens if I make this 200, we get something that looks very much bell shaped. And, and in the grand scheme of things, this is a fairly continuous 
distribution. There are there aren't infinitely many values, but there are a lot of values. So as n becomes large, in fact, by around 30, we see a nice distribution. And, and when this becomes even bigger, if we have one, now we've, we've timed out on the applet, but as this becomes bigger, we get something that looks increasingly more and more normal. Okay, so a normal distribution can actually be an approximation to a binomial experiment if the sample size is large. So if n exceeds 30, we can actually approximate the binomial distribution with the normal distribution. And if a random variable x follows a normal distribution, we say x is distributed, x is distributed, as a random normal random variable with mean mu and standard deviation sigma. So in this particular distribution, the mean and standard deviation give you everything you need to know about the shape of, of the curve that we would get. And f of x, the probability density function, in discrete probability, we often call the, these probability generating functions probability mass functions, but in the continuous world, we, we call them density functions because the point wise, the point wise probability of getting any specific value is zero when you're dealing with continuous distributions. Why? Well, because there are infinitely many values and to get exactly one out of those infinitely many, there's a 0% chance of that. So usually we use these continuous distributions when we're looking for the probability that something falls within a, a, a range of, of, of values. And the, the mean is just the expected value of x. The sigma is the standard deviation of x, the way we would compute mean and standard deviation in our, our typical computations of, of mean and and variance. What will be interesting is that x equals mu will represent the axis of symmetry and sigma will determine the spread of the distribution. So let's take a look at a simulation applet and there is a binomial with, with 10,000, n equals 10,000. You can see that that almost, you can't even see the bars in that particular one. Now here is the, the graph of this normal distribution and it is this function so notice that pi is a constant mu and sigma are our mean and standard deviation x is just going to be the horizontal axis so once you plug in sigma mu and um, and pi then you get just one variable in this equation it looks scary it looks intimidating but we don't often work with it uh, from scratch. Now in, in Desmos, one of the things I have to do is when I enter this is I, I put an S for Sigma and M for Mu, and then I, I put in sliders for them so that I can see what effect that would have. So if I just change Mu, all that's going to do is change the mean. Notice it doesn't change the shape of that distribution at all. The shape is the same, it's just being shifted left or right. So if the mean is zero, then it's, then X equals zero will represent the axis of symmetry such that if we were to uh, fold it onto itself over the x-axis, I'm sorry, over x equals zero, the y-axis, then we would get two overlapping, perfectly overlapping shapes. And there we have, you know, x, x equals four, so mu is located at x equals four. And now let's watch what happens when we change s. So s is the standard deviation. If we make it bigger, it's still, notice its center is still at four, but it becomes more spread out. So if we had some, some measurement, maybe, maybe we were measuring people's preference on a, on some sort of scale from a one being the lowest, 10 being the highest. And, and in a situation where, where people are, are, you know, think that whatever they're rating is okay, you're gonna have a, a tight occurrence of, of fives being given. So you notice that most people's responses in this case is I make the standard deviation really small, 
are, are very narrowly located right around u equals 5. But if, if people respond almost randomly, you can see that as I, as I increase sigma, the, the curve kind of becomes vertically flatter and, and spreads out horizontally even more. So when you think about geometrically what mu does, mu just shifts the entire distribution and sigma will, will make it wider or narrower. Now the area under this curve is still one, but we have to go farther left and farther right to accumulate that area. Whereas for smaller sigmas, you can see that most of our area falls between say two and, and x equals two and x equals eight. Great, so that, that about gives us a good sense of the normal distribution itself. Of course, now what we can do is we can find probabilities and we can answer some, some real world questions and we're gonna go ahead and do that in the next video.